Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the CX Goalkeeper podcast. Today I'm super thrilled because I have Michael Obermeyer together with me and we are going to discuss about create hyper-personalized interactions that matter. Oh, this, is, this is a great topic. I'm very looking forward to this discussion. Hi, Michael. How are you? Hey, Greg. How are you? Thanks for having me. Um... I know I'm said said it once. I'll kind of say it again. You have an awesome show, and it's uh, I feel honored to be here, given that you had so many really great stars on the show already. So yeah, super excited to have this conversation with you today. You are the next top player, and I asked you several <laughs> times to join. I know you are extremely bu busy. However, I am super happy that we we will have now um, the discussion together about this outstanding topic. Michael, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Maybe let's start with uh, the, the private piece first. So I'm married, two grown-up kids, and a dog. I live close to Vienna in the beautiful country, Austria. And honestly, I, one of the things, the reason I love your show is because I played soccer myself, only as an amateur, though, and only until 15. Um, but I really enjoyed it, and I uh, played until I was 15 as a midfielder in defense. So... Um, that, that's basically about me from a, let's say, private point of view. And from a business point of view, I'd say, so not just did I play different positions when I was a soccer player, I also played different positions uh, professionally. So I was working uh, in professional services environment. I was working in support, in marketing, business development, pre-sales and sales, uh, and also in different teams. So I worked in the medical device industry, media, telecommunications, consultancy, uh, and eventually I spent most of my time uh, in enterprise software. Uh, and I also spent two years at the army, which is a bit of an outlier maybe, but I think uh, when it comes down to what is the connecting tissue between all these experiences, it was always to work with a great team of people uh, to create better outcomes for customers. And I think that's what we're here today. That's great. Uh, and I'm sure you are going to score several goals today, even if you are a defender or, mid or midfield player. But to learn a bit more about you, which values drive you in life? I've been listening to your podcast, so I was I was expecting the question. And while it sounds a very insolent question, actually, it's, it, it was pretty hard because I, I never really thought about it before. But obviously, I did my homework. Uh, and I would say like the three, three uh, core values that, that drove me ever since uh, are curiosity. And that's why I thought like I bring my little cap with me. Um, because I think like curiosity is, you know, for me, it's like looking at the world like a kid, uh, being open, open to learn new things, open to find out. And I think in the line of business that we are, uh, and everyone in CX is to, to have this curiosity and feed it um, and to be open for new things, to be open for feedback and, uh, and, and take different perspectives. Uh, that, that's one thing that always helped me better empathize and understand uh, the people I was working with or working for. Uh, secondly, um, I'm a strong believer in in mutual relationships, right? Uh, so like in a soccer team where you have like a ton of different people with very different skills, they all have one common goal and you have to rely on each other and have a great level of relationship and a great network to achieve one goal. Uh, and I, I strongly, strongly think that these relationships is something that helped me be successful uh, in the past and where I can make uh, my teams and my customers uh, successful as well. And thirdly, uh, I can be very passionate about things, um, passion in the very sense of the word. So sometimes uh, I'm going above and beyond, which is probably not always healthy. And it's what my top wife is also telling me, uh, but I still try to keep it, keep it fun, right? Uh, but passion is, is probably number three uh, on my core values. And I think this is also the confirmation of the outstanding LinkedIn post that you are writing with a lot of engagement because they are funny. And we really feel the passion that you have for the topics, the ideas that you are sharing, and also the time that you are investing in creating this outstanding LinkedIn uh, post. But it's not only about LinkedIn post. I was able or I saw you also uh, on stage, we had a lot of discussion. You are very knowledgeable. You know a lot. And therefore, I am super keen to kick off this discussion. And you uh, decided to speak about creating, uh, create hyper-personalized interaction that matters. And I think this is a super interesting topic and um, keen to, to, to ask the first question. What are some of the most effective methods or tools for creating, gathering, and understanding customer data? Because I think this is the 
the basics to personalize that experiences. Yeah, that, that's that's actually very true. And uh, I, I just want to quickly quote because it just came to my mind. So, so there's a great definition of hyper-personalization and it's, it's, it's really about brands having this unique capability to tailor their messaging to a single individual based on their uh, on their um, needs and their wants and leveraging, as you rightfully said, data, analytics, automation uh, to position the right message at the right time through the right channel uh, in the right place, right? Because context ultimately is what makes or breaks a good message, right? And the, the, the biggest the biggest challenge is, and we heard this from a study we did with CMOs quite a while ago, is that there are billions of data points lying around in organizations. Most often than not, they're locked up in some silos. Uh, and CMOs have a really, really hard time processing all the data that they are capturing, but also other departments are collecting. And some of the CMOs even said that the, the level of maturity they think their organizations have in capturing data and then also, you know, using the data to activate their customers lies somewhere between two and, and uh, tw 28 to, to 30%, which is a shockingly no, low number. Now, what we see when we work with our customers uh, and what we have when we have conversations is that there is a lot of data to be, to be leveraged. And obviously we have in, a, in the age of digital, a lot of, a lot of digital behavior data uh, that we can use. There's a lot of transactional information. So when you think of, for example, a retail company, um, what have they bought in the past? What is currently in their basket? Um, maybe there is some loyalty information that you can leverage, uh, spending patterns. Um, uh, so th there's a lot of information that you can use already today that you don't necessarily have to ask the customer because it's part of your business model to collect this information. Now, um, there might be different examples of insurance companies which could possibly uh, use data that they have from other interaction touch points, such as, for example, uh, from telephony system, right? So when people call in, if they have a question about a contract or something, uh, and you record those conversations, that's a great way of understanding um, where a customer's at in their particular life cycles, for example, and what could be possible uh, things you could recommend to them or how you can make their lives easier, right? So there are different ways of, of capturing this information. Uh, or you, if you think more from a B2B standpoint, because obviously most of the examples you always hear are from the consumer perspective, but what if you are a B2B company, how can you leverage those data points, right? And you could, for example, uh, think of using IoT, so Internet of Things data from a truck or from a bus and collect all these kind of uh, data points while the vehicle is driving, right? What is the behavior of the driver? Um, or when do I have to change a part before it basically breaks, right? To make sure that the uptime of, of the truck or of the bus is very high, which eventually creates uh, a better profitability of, of the, the company who's owning the truck or the bus. So there are very, very different ways on, on, on using data and collecting data that goes beyond just, you know, a form on the internet or, um, the demographics you usually would have. And, and lastly, just one more, one more thing, obviously when you have analytics in place and if you have artificial intelligence in place, uh, you can also derive obviously information based on what you have. You can make kind of assumptions as in terms of obviously predictive uh, analytics. You mentioned something like 30% are already able to do that and 70% are not yet ready. Perhaps what are your suggestions? What's what's your view? Where should this company, these 70% of companies that cannot do that, where should they start? Right. So maybe to put this in perspective, so the 30% the uh, is, is CMOs, which kind of like estimate their own maturity of doing it based on different factors. Um, so I wouldn't say they're not able to do it, but probably they're not there for organizational technical reasons, right? So um, I would say there are a couple of things that, that you can always do as an organization is um, before you start buying any technology, you should figure out basically what you would like to achieve. So really coming down from, I know this sounds a bit, you know, like kind of like textbook-ish, but really coming down from what is the vision I have for my customer experience program, right? What is the, what are the strategic 
uh, pillars basically on which they're built. And what are the, my tactics, right? What are the tactics and if you will, like your use cases or your user stories that you would like to implement before you even think about uh, going down the rabbit hole of picking a particular software that kind of helps you do these things. Uh, and if you have broken it down to the user story, it'll figure out, okay, what is the kind of data I need to enable those use cases? And then you will quickly find out that probably the data is already there. Um, and then, then it comes the hard part because this is like, you know, obviously you have to think a lot about it, uh, put on your thinking hat, but then it comes the hard part, which is the organization, right? And rules, policies, um, probably it's also legacy information um, technology that's in place. But what we feel a lot of times is that it's more of a getting different departments to talk to each other and share their data openly or be willing to uh, you know, tap into different data sources that, that, that makes it easier or harder than actually having the right software in place. Let's put it that way. Uh, you said that it's a bit from the textbook, but I think this is the reality because basically you need to start having the foundation, having the right setup. And I know not every company can do everything what it's written in this book, but a big part of it makes sense because then you know where you want to go, where you want to get, how to get there and so on. And perhaps now we spoke about some suggestions for this company. Now going back to the best practices, uh, could you share some best practices that are already able to provide meaningful customer experiences? Absolutely. So. Um... There are two cases that I particularly love to talk about. Uh, the one is a retail company that is not so known in Europe, but I think in the US, it's a very well-known brand. They called Ulta Beauty. Um, it's you know one of the largest beauty retailers um, in, in, in the States. Um, and what they do is um, they have a huge loyalty program going on. And, and one of their, their, their main levers is that they have a, an absolutely amazing way of how they have a holistic picture of their customers. Uh, they call them guests, basically. And when you think about a guest, they have these different kind of like areas, how they understand. Obviously, there's all the demographic information that you would usually get just because people maybe filled in their application forms or they know, okay, the gender, you know, probably some preferred products, you know, the age range, these kind of things, where they live. Um, obviously what they also have is all the information about their purchase history, right? So what is their average cart uh, value? How much, how often are they coming to, to the online store or in, the, or in their, in their brick and mortar stores? Uh, what kind of products are they buying? Are they more like in the budget uh, tiers or are they like the premium tiers? Um, but they also have like these different loyalty capabilities. They can collect points. They have different loyalty tiers, obviously. Uh, and, and they have a credit card program so people can spend obviously money through a Visa or MasterCard. So there is a lot of data that they actually spend as, as collecting. And obviously they have all the digital behavior data because Ulta Beauty also has an app, right? And that app obviously is one of their major touch points when it comes to interacting with their guests. Uh, and one of the core features they have is a capability that allows um, users to actually look into an, a mirror, if you like. Like it's an augmented reality capability where you look into the mirror and then the, the, the app basically scans your face and, and recognizes your, your features. Like if you high, have high cheekbones, if you have a small chin, you know what your eyebrows are, what is the, the, you know, like the color of your skin. And then based on these different beauty, beauty features, um, the app will recommend different kind of like makeup combinations, right? And then think of, you know, a dating app where you swipe left or right. You can say, I like this, I don't like that. And so the system in the back end is basically artificial intelligence that learns about these different kind of preferences and will be better and better and better in, in, in basically recommending you new products uh, that you can use. Obviously, it's a two-way street. On the one side, you create a valuable and an exciting experience because you can make like you have like a makeup party that is virtual, right? And you can mix and match things and try out things to see what they look like on your face. Um, so you have a great experience from a customer perspective, and you maybe get to explore new products you haven't thought about. And obviously, you have like the the upside for the for, for all the beauty because they learn a lot about their consumers. Uh, and uh, they can obviously leverage the data for ongoing campaigns. Now, everybody who's in the business will obviously like that. That's an awesome thing, but 
I cannot do this because my customers won't let me collect the data. And um, there is this awesome concept um, that's called um, value exchange, right? And everybody who's, you know, is, uh, is, is in the CX business has heard about the term, I guess. So value exchange is the idea of what is in for the customer versus what's in for the company. And how can you bring those two kind of like uh, um, expectations together? And in the Alta case, it's really great because consumers are like, hey, I want a fun experience. I want to try out new things. And that's why I'm willing to give very personal information that otherwise you would get from, from a consumer. Like, you know, what does my face look like? And these kind of things, this can be very personal, very intimate in a way. And on the other side, the company says like, hey, I want all your data. Um, and, and this is a great way of doing it. Um, maybe it's not applicable to insurance companies or banks in that particular aspect. But I think that, that these kind of examples, uh, if you take them and, and kind of like think uh, in the way of, hey, if I were a bank, how, how would I leverage this case uh, is, is a great, great thinking experiment, if you will. Um, the second example is more traditional one in, this, in the sense of it's an insurance company that uh, is in Germany, uh, they're called Ergo. And what they're doing is uh, something very interesting. They are basically um, having a contact center and whenever customers are calling in, they obviously get asked for privacy reasons if it's okay to collect, uh, collect information from the call and record the, the call, the whole call conversation basically. Um, and that conversation then goes through an analytical process, right? So once the conversation is over, um, the the whole spoken uh, conversation is transcribed into into words and with words, obviously. And then a text analytics engine is basically kind of picking the whole conversation apart and is trying to figure out what actually happened in a conversation. And there are a couple of you know products coming out of this process. So obviously we have the opportunity to train agents, which is always great because they can give future customers a better experience by you know being more empathic on the conversation, being more on point, being more helpful, whatever. The second piece that is coming out of this is um, uh, improving products, right? If a customer complains about a certain policy or some kind of legal text, uh, it could be it could be a reason for the insurance is like well maybe we have to improve on on, on the text maybe be more you know easier to, to to understand or maybe we just remove that piece because it, it creates a lot of friction um, and then there is another great piece and that is uh, leads right so whenever somebody calls into an insurance and for example says hey I would like to change my address or would like to change my name obviously everybody thinks like well if somebody changes their address um, and maybe move from the little small single apartment in the city down to the suburbs into a larger house, you need a bigger insurance for your property, right? And if you're moving into a bigger house, probably your family is growing. Yeah, maybe you have a second car. So suddenly an innocent conversation creates a whole new opportunity to serve your customer better. Uh, or if somebody changes the name, you know, similar idea, maybe somebody has married. So if they're married, Maybe, you know, they're going to do other things. So th there are so many great examples of, of doing this. And one of the things that obviously um, Ergo and other insurance companies are looking into right now, or any company that has a contact center is like, how can I make this process more real time? Meaning that I don't have like the processing of the call after the fact that it happened, but have it right in the conversation. So think of you and me having this conversation right now. And why we have the conversation, I have on my little agent desktop an intelligent widget that tells me, hey, Michael, uh, Greg just said he's going to move out of town uh, into a bigger house. Maybe you want to address the, uh, the topic of uh, having a larger property insurance. So getting the, the context and the offer closer to the conversation obviously increases the probability that uh, we land uh, a, an additional product. So a couple of, well, not too quick, but hopefully quick enough examples of how, how to yeah, apply this. Uh, I, I love these examples that are longer because first of all, we feel your passion for this topic. <laughs> and second, with a longer explanation, it's a bit more clear what are the opportunities and also what can be done in future. And I really like this two example from, from, from the insurance field, but also one specific uh, related to, to retail and beauty products. Uh, which beauty products are you using? 
joke aside i'm not asking that joke aside well thank you people... <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me that after the recording that uh, the audience don't need to follow that uh, jo joke aside i think also there you mentioned that also from the retail but also from the, the insurance company this opportunity of having real-time exchange and creating value you spoke a lot about personalization uh, customer experience then at the end also loyalty offering additional features and uh, and return on investment uh, how do you how can you connect everything with with what you're saying right so i think there's like a an impact chain or a value chain between those different topics right so personalization as such is basically the idea of giving somebody the feeling of being something special and having understood their their what they, their wants and needs and their aspirations in in a more holistic way if you will uh, and leveraging those insights uh, and active actively you you're communicating with your consumers based on those insights naturally leads to better customer experiences. There have been some studies from McKinsey and also from Gartner who have been looking at like the relationship between personalization and, and positive uh, customer experiences, but there's a strong link between those two. Um, there is another study that Gartner took the CMOs back in 2020, I believe, uh, that was looking at the impact of customer experiences towards loyalty. Now, back in the days, the study said, if I'm not mistaken, that almost two thirds of, let's say two thirds in terms of like the influence that CX has versus brand versus price, CX had the lion's share of influence and loyalty. I would argue these days, this has shifted, right? So obviously price has taken a stronger lead uh, in influencing loyalty, sadly to some extent, but it's understandably, but still CX has a strong, still strong influence on loyal, uh, loyalty of your customers. Now, what we all know, what we don't necessarily need to study for, uh, but we all learn in business school is that loyal customers stay longer, spend more, recommend more, and thus they have naturally a higher customer lifetime value, right? Um, and we see in different studies that companies who are using personalization ultimately can create a revenue lift of up to 10 to 20%, depending on, you know, the business model they have a, a pure digital company will create obviously a higher lift just because costs are low and, and the automation is, is easier than a classical brick and mortar store but there is a significant lift uh, of revenue when you are personalizing. And, and what you're saying, I think it's the summary of the importance of customer experience personalization. This, uh, we are driving this topic because it's a growth strategy, because as you said, it's more acquisition, it's more retention, it's more a uh, share of wallet. And, and I think it's key. Based on, on the fact that we discussed and you shared also some example of, uh, of the, the insurance of the retailer getting a lot of data and you shared also that customer needs to be willing to share the data. Yes. Uh, what, what strategies should brands adapt to deliver these personalized experiences while ensuring uh, respect of customer privacy and all the regulation that we have in Europe, in the USA and, and so on? Yes. So it's, it's a slippery slope kind of thing. Uh, because of all these regulations. But I think that in essence, transparency and data ethics are key. And the reason I'm saying this is, as with all the studies, you know, you can, you can take those numbers at face value, but when I look at a McKinsey study, which, which was basically trying to figure out how many people want personalization, three out of four consumers in the study, 4,000 consumers globally said, hey, I want some level of personalization. And if it doesn't happen, I will be disappointed. That, that, that's a reasonable statement, right? But then there's a KPMG study that said like, hey, seven out of 10 people are actually worried what happens with their data at those brands you're buying from. Now, you know, these are very contradictory um, statements, right? Either on the one side, people want personalization, on the other side, they don't want to give away that data. So how 
how in the in the world is it possible? Now, again, what, what I'm trying to say is that if you want to earn consumer trust, and this is like the number one driver uh, here in, to make this happen, you have to be 100% transparent as, an, as a brand on what you're doing with the data of your customers, right? And I think if you are upfront with them and, and giving them a good reason, and then good reason meaning value, right? of sharing the data with you, then you will earn the trust over time. So I think that's like a, it's not a one-time thing. I think this is like, you, you get get a bit, a little bit of data from the from your customers. They realize you're using it in, in, a, in an ethical way and in a relevant way for them. Uh, and then trust grows. And when trust grows, they're willing to give you more data, right? Um, sadly, we are an old Amazon and we are an old, Facebook, because obviously the rules are not applicable to these platforms. It seems like everybody's willing to share everything about them on these platforms. Everyone else just doesn't have that. So they have to go the hard, hard way of earning the trust over and over and over again. And the easiest way is to be upfront with your customers, giving them something that's valuable, uh, and then hopefully get data in return. That makes sense. It it totally makes sense, and I also still struggle understanding why we are giving so much trust to some companies and not so much to others, even if we know that these companies are using our data and not perhaps not always with the best possible intent. But that's not something that I need to to judge. It's it's a philosophical question. I think that that the good the good brands are getting punished for the few that have screwed up. You know. Uh, the whole yes. thing. That, that's true. The, uh, to conclude this game, um, everybody's speaking about Nasdaq section. And right. I was able, uh, and I listened to podcast where you were a guest and also to one presentation, and you already speak about next best experience. Could you please share this, this concept with us? Right. Yeah, there, there's just obviously a little distinction, but let me just take two steps back because uh, the reason... We're talking about next business experiences is about what is what is the driver for that statement and when you when you look at what personalization means um that and i said it before is like that's when consumers associate something with a positive experience that gives them the feeling of being something special on the one side and being recognized as individuals with their own interests and needs that that's one of the consumer studies that was was looking into how consumers perceive personalization, what they expect from the brands. And then there was another, and that's for me the most important statement from brands they buy from, what they expect is basically that they're not only investing in the transaction, but also in the relationship. And that's for me like, that's like the boom moment I had when I read that study, right? And when you kind of like think about it, next best actions, and next best offers are usually, you know, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. Here's a exactly. coupon. Do that. Exactly. Exactly. And whenever I talk to banks and insurances, everyone will tell you, look, the last five, 10, 15 years, we have trained our salespeople to sell on a transactional level, building relationships. We have unlearned this capability because we are kind of controlling our sales teams based on product sold. Now, a consumer isn't always in the sell in the buying mood, right? And salespeople are always in selling mood. Now, the, <laughs> let's put it that way. And what, what we believe, strongly believe, is creating those next best experiences is a way where you basically pave the way to the next sell by using different other touch points. Um, for example, if I'm a bank, to stay with that example, and I want to kind of like build a relationship with a person, I need to understand where they are in their particular life cycle. As a bank, it's easy because I see all the spendings. I can kind of like make an educated guess. Is it a student? Is it a married couple? Do they have kids? Where do they live? What does have they a large or small budget to spend on? But I can use these different hints within the life cycle to give them maybe product advice or train them on uh, uh, financially education services, yeah? or just uh, give them maybe ideas for the next vacation. It doesn't necessarily always have to be the next product. I'll give you one other example because it just came to mind. We have a retailer in Germany um, 
who, for example, have a particular loyalty club for young parents where they can sign up their kids. And on the app, for example, people wake up in the morning or in the night and pick up their phone repeatedly. Uh, the app in the background may, if they have approved this, may realize the sudden motion of the phone in a certain period of time. And that could basically trigger something like a, hey, is your baby having problems sleeping? Maybe you want to try these one, two, three things, right? While this sounds intrusive for us, for their customers, it was obviously something they really appreciated because they, they felt like they were seen, like understood, like, oh my God, it's three in the morning. My baby's crying again because God knows why, because it's my first kid and I have no freaking idea how it works. Um, but maybe these are things I can use, right? And by creating this kind of relationship, they will obviously have the brand at top of their mind. And that's like the ultimate thing you want to achieve as a brand, being top of mind the next time somebody is going to, to market and buy something, right? And this is where we think like next best experience will always trump next best action or offers. Thank you very much for this outstanding discussion. I cannot let you know, uh, let you go before we finish this discussion. The game is coming to an end in the extra time. The last three minutes, three questions for you. Fast forward right. in 10 years from now, we are back on the CX Goalkeeper podcast. What we are discussing about? Hopefully, uh, we're going to reminisce uh, reminiscing on the good old days where the budgets were tight, KPIs were loved at, and all the execs who didn't get it. And we're going to have a good laugh and, and, and say like, hey, the future is bright. Now look at all these awesome success stories we have achieved. Um, I think this would be a good future for CX, given how how difficult it seems to be in the last couple of years um, when you talk to different six uh, responsible people. Thank you, and we are link linking that back to the vision that you mentioned earlier. That's the vision what we should achieve. And therefore yes. it's also a textbook, but it's it's a great <laughs> answer and very positive. And we take the optimism that that you have and we hope that to spread also to the to the audience. What's the best way to contact you? Oh, the best was probably LinkedIn. Uh, so don't be afraid to connect. Obviously, uh, you can follow me if you like, uh, but reach out. I love to talk about CX. Obviously, I love to talk about marketing, leadership, um, culture. So feel free to, yeah, connect. And I would say to the audience, it's worth it. Connect with Michael. Now we are coming to the last question. Is Michael's golden nugget. It's something that we discussed on or something new to leave to the audience with. Right. So I usually love to sound smart, uh, but I, I feel like today I should steal from someone I, I personally admire and I think is a very smart person who has been, sadly. Um, Steve Jobs once said, you got to start with the custom experience and work backward to the technology because you can start with the tech and then try to figure out how to use it. And I think that was, that was visionary because he said it, I think, like in the late 90s or something. Uh, and this one still holds true today. And I, I always try when I have those conversations with my customers um, to start with the experience, right? And then figure out how we get there and not the other way around. Um, and yeah, that's my golden nugget. Thank you very much, Michael. The experience of this discussion was great. The technology worked well. Therefore, we are sure the audience will enjoy this discussion. And I enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much, Michael, for your time. Thank you for having me, Greg. It was awesome. Michael, please stay with me. For the audience, it's everything for today. Please contact Connect Michael and let us know what you think about this episode. Thank you very much and bye-bye. 